Good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. John Nordling of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, and it's my privilege to uh, lead you pastors uh, today with um, the text uh, for Epiphany 3b, which is Mark chapter 1, 14 to 20. And uh, let us begin with the collect for the day. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, mercifully look upon our infirmities and stretch forth the hand of your majesty to heal and defend us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, uh, one of the things that I like to do is uh, draw connections, if any, uh, between the collect of the day and the gospel. And I mu must confess to you that I don't really see very much uh, connecting the two uh, today. Uh, the best that I can do is our infirmities, which may have to do with the fact of uh, the calling of, of Simon and his brother Andrew and, uh, and uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Um, but it's more like a healing narrative, and that's going to be our uh, next text. Um, and then to heal and defend us would be another point of contact. Possibly it's a stretch, I admit. But um, how uh, the Lord is going to use uh, those um, three uh, uh, disciples especially to further his kingdom. So they would need to be healed, that is, brought to repentance and then faith in the gospel uh, as they were to bring the gospel to others. So there may be a connection there between the, um, the collect of the day and the text. So let's now turn to the text. And it divides uh, pretty evenly into two parts. Um, my uh, my uh, uh, UBS uh, Greek New Testament has very convenient titles uh, the beginning of the Galilean ministry um, for the first uh, two verses, and then verses 16 through uh, 20, the calling of the four fishermen. So that works pretty well. And this text uh, begins immediately after the temptation of Jesus, which in Mark's gospel is shrunk down into two verses. So it's very brief and fast moving. So if we look at the text then, um, and after uh, uh, the um, betrayal of John, okay, so you have meta with de para dothenai uh, ton ioannin. So you have a classic instance of an articular infinitive. Meta is a preposition that patterns with the accusative uh, neuter um, definite article ta. So after the betrayal of John. Now notice that article there with John, and I've underlined kind of the leading dramatis personae in this text. Uh, the, the, name, the, the principal characters have been underlined. But John, and that's all this says about it, but it expects you to remember that um, in John or in, in Mark, 6, 14 to 29, there's going to be a flashback. And Mark is there going to give us the fullest account of the uh, betrayal of John, how, is he, how he's imprisoned, how Herod uh, makes this vow that he can't keep. And uh, Herodias is his wife. Actually, she's the wife of, of Philip, his brother. And then Herodias' daughter uh, dances and um, so Herod makes this vow, I will give you anything up to the half of my kingdom. And immediately the girl says, the head of John the Baptist. And so at once uh, an executioner is sent out and his head is brought on a platter. So that's a very memorable scene. It has a lesser account in Matthew, Matthew 14, 1 to 12. But... Um, 
uh, the more vivid account is in Mark. And as you know, Mark is supposedly the stripped down version, but sometimes when you have these, it's actually fuller. So that's the case here. So that's, that's how this text begins then, with the betrayal of John. Then Jesus comes. So you have this order in all of the synoptics, first John, then Jesus, and Jesus comes. And what I've done here is I've um, put Jesus' name in the red, and I've also bolded it to make it kind of like a, a, an icon or something, <laughs> an illuminated manuscript. So Jesus came to Galilee. What's he doing? He's doing two things. He is preaching the gospel of God and saying, and then we have the content of his message, the time hath been fulfilled and the kingdom of God hath drawn near. Then repent ye, metanoeta kaipistuita in to euangelio. Repent and believe in the gospel. So what a glorious summation that Mark has done here of, of this um, message of Jesus who is bringing the gospel now to Galilee right after his temptation. Um, what can we say here that hasn't been said a million times? First of all, um, the participles keruson and legon are both present active. So this is present ongoing activity. Um, and what's he preaching? He's preaching the gospel, the gospel of God. So do you, pastor, also preach the gospel of God? Okay, so that's the connection. Uh, and, and the whole idea of law and gospel, I think, does enter in here. The gospel of God and saying, and this is the content, the time hath been fulfilled. Now look at that perfect uh, peple. Peplerotai, the time hath been, this is kairos, the kairotic time hath been fulfilled. Um, you know, it always means fulfilled. I'm working on Philippians right now, and I just noticed this came to me, and maybe it's completely um, impertinent. But in Philippians 4.18, Paul says that he has been filled up, having received from Epaphroditus the offering from the Philippians, okay? And that, I did some work on that pepleromai, there it's first person singular. It means to be paid off, okay? Like uh, it, it occurs in the papyri. So I'm wondering if there's any uh, purchase here with this pepleroti, the time hath been paid off. It's completely filled and Christ has now come in the flesh to preach and to say, and, and, uh, and, and, and the kingdom of God uh, drawing near. Um, something else about the kingdom of God here, this very pregnant phrase, uh, he uh, basileia tutheu, uh, which is so common, and we need to mention that very quickly. One of the things is that in Matthew, you have the kingdom of heaven, okay? the he basileia ton uranon. In Mark, though, it's kingdom of God, like you have here. So it occurs 14 times. I checked them all out. For example, Mark 4, 11, 26, 30, 9, 1, 9, 47, 10, 14, 15, 23, and then a bunch more times. So what you need to do is check a good concordance, like Moulton and Gieden, that's where I get this information. And just start reading some things and drawing them together, and you'll see um, how this uh, initial statement by Jesus is carried out over the course of his ministry as depicted by Mark's gospel. And then the charge, repent and believe. Uh, law and gospel. And notice it's in the second person plural, and it's present active imperative, okay? So keep on repenting and keep on believing. Is this not, believing in the gospel, okay? <laughs> so is this not a fine summation of what it means to be a Christian, 
constantly repenting of our sins and having faith in the good news for the sinners that we are um, as God's uh, law uh, uncovers in us. I think it's glorious. It happened there in Jesus' initial charge, and it still happens, I hope, in your message as well, O oh, pastor. All right, let's keep moving because Jesus moves along. Um, let me uh, put this away. Uh, no, not put it away, but there, okay. Now, um, so in verse 16, and, and, uh, and passing along the Sea of Galilee, so Jesus goes north first to Galilee. That's what we know before he goes up to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, he saw, and then we have Simon and Andrew, his brother. Now, Simon, of course, Simon Peter, um, later in, um, right now we're going to have the calling of four disciples, Simon, a.k.a. Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James and John, sons of Zebedee, those four, okay, the pillars, in other words. I know that's not the word actually used here, but the four. And then in Mark 3, um, you're going to have the names given of the 12, okay? So this is the earliest point where Jesus is collecting his disciples and organizing them for ministry, the ministry of which you now occupy as a pastor in Christ's church. So uh, Simon um, and Andrew, his brother. Now just look at how this is structured. Simon, of course, first. Uh, Simon's name is first. And then Andrew, the brother of Simon. So this tells us that, uh, that um, uh, the reason why Andrew's name is mentioned here is because he is the brother of Peter. And in John 1, we have the account of how Andrew goes to his brother. Okay, so that seems to be known. It's from a slightly different angle. But um, uh, Andrew has the great uh, uh, task of bringing uh, Peter, uh, Simon, into uh, to Christ. And then, of course, the rest is history. Simon is the one on whom the pillars are set. The, the kingdom of God is set on, on Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ. Okay, and what are they doing? They are amphibolontas ente uh, uh, ente They are casting a net, amphibolontas, into the sea, the Sea of Galilee. For they were haliais, uh, fishermen. Now I put the haliais in blue. I thought there might be some significance to that. Actually, it's also in Matthew 4, and it's both used here that they were uh, fishermen. And then a little bit later, um, down in verse 17, where it says that they were, that Jesus wants them to become holies anthropon, fishermen of men, or fishers of men. Uh, the word holius is from hulls, uh, hullus. And you know that word as salt. So they are salts, that is, fishermen. And that's really, I think, all that can be said about that, for they were fishermen. Um, uh, the BDAG, though, makes the statement that Jesus kind of is continuing the, um, uh, what he's doing is he is continuing their earlier vocation into the vocation they're going to be having now as, as, as disciples and fishers of men, bringing people in to the kingdom, just as your uh, ministry does and as your preaching does. I think that can be made. Verse 17, and Jesus said to them, and so once again I have um, uh, reddened and bolded the name of Jesus, ha Jesus. Uh, Duta opisomu, so come behind me, kai poi eso humas genestai holies anthropon. Come after me, and I shall make you to be. Notice genestai, aorist, middle, uh, or deponent, uh, infinitive, 
to be fishermen of men. So this is the incredible um, charge that Jesus makes of Simon, uh, who is a fisherman, and Andrew, his brother. And uh, John, can you now screen up a little bit so that I can get the rest of it? Uh, and it says in verse 18, and immediately, there's that mark and word, euthus, um, and immediately, having left their nets, they followed him. So right away. So off, uh, off entes here you have, and then down here in verse 20, you're going to have um, off entes again, used of James and John, leaving their brother, uh, their, their father, Zebedee, in the boat. So it's kind of interesting that you have that, uh, that repeated um, statement there. Let's see, okay. Um, so he, uh, and, and having gone on um, a little further, verse 19, uh, he saw James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So again, the same thing. Now, I take this to mean that James is slightly more prominent than John, because you have that, that appellation, John, his brother, the brother of him is what the Greek says. And James would have been known because of his association with Zebedee. I ransacked the Bible dictionary trying to find out more about Zebedee. And all I could really find out was that he was a first century fisherman living in Galilee who may have been uh, of high standing and had some wealth. So this may have been a fishing exercise, a fishing enterprise, uh, be that as it may. It's how these guys are known. Um, and again, he uh, calls them, and what are they doing? It says in verse 19 that they are mending their nets. Okay, kat artidzantas tadiktua, mending their nets. And the nets, of course, are used to capture fish. And you wonder if maybe there's some type of a reference here to how the disciples in the ministry of Jesus are going to be capturing men uh, through the gospel that they are privileged to preach and to teach. <clears throat> and immediately, verse 20, there's a euthus again. Uh, uh, he called them. Uh, this calling uh, is, is, what is it? It's a calling to faith certainly, but a calling also to ministry, to a new vocation. And I think you can use this also in your preaching to your people. Um, your people all have vocations, uh, truck drivers and teachers and mothers and fathers and students and children, and they all have something that they're doing. Um, but they're Christians too, right? And so you're calling them to faith and to vocation uh, as, as, as Christians where God has planted them. So the same thing is kind of going on here with the four, but in a greater way because these four are the apostles of Christ, indeed the most prominent ones, Simon and James and John, sons of Zebedee, uh, and they're the ones uh, whose ministry resounds still today in the preaching office of the church. Okay, and having left their, uh, their father Zebedee in the boat um, uh, with, with the, uh, with the uh, hired men, tone misthotone, only in Mark do you have that detail added, they went behind him, they went after him, okay? So um, boat often, you know, has a, an association with the church, uh, so Zebedee in the church, I don't know, it's a bit of a stretch, but with the hirelings, um, I think this may mean, first of all, it's historically true, this actually happened uh, uh, in reality, but then the hirelings has the idea, I think, of how the gospel is for free. The disciples preach and teach um, not for filthy lucre or material gain, but to bring kingdom people into the kingdom. 
for whom Christ's death and resurrection has purchased them. So, um, the passage is just brimming with uh, wonderful ex, uh, 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 exegetical possibilities. You could focus in on any one of these or several of them. And I pray that the Lord would bless your teaching and your preaching richly on this text. Thank you very much.